We can't tell. We don't know. It says that our imaginations can't even can't even cover that. All right. Well, this afternoon, um, if you have your Bibles, and why would you come here without it? <laughs> so, if you have your Bibles, let's turn over to. Uh, we're going to be in Daniel chapter five. Daniel chapter five. And I have a question for you. You know, I like doing the series of who was. I don't want anybody to say anything, but you can hold your hands up. Who knows who uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were? Who knows who those, who were they? Does anybody know? That's, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, something that I found interesting in when I was doing a little reading here about this, the names, now that's, that is not what we're going to be looking at today, just, just to let you know. Uh, the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was not their Jewish given names. Those were the names given to them by the Chaldeans for their gods. But the names of their, their Jewish names actually included the name of God in their names. Uh, Azariah, uh, Hananiah, and Mishael. The A-H, the part on the end of their names is from Jehovah, God. And Mishael from Elohim. Uh, the the Jewish names, some of the Jewish, Jewish names for uh, God, our God. And uh, I thought that interesting because then you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah. Uh, who else do we have? There, there's, I mean, there's many of these ones. And so that really, that really explains quite a bit. But the one we're going to be talking about today is Daniel. And Daniel, the... O, Yo, the El is from Elohim. So Daniel is his name. Now, the Chaldeans gave Daniel a name too. What was his name in Chaldean? It was bel T shazar But the person that we're going to be talking about today is Belshazzar. Anyways, what we're going to do, let's read the entire chapter of Daniel chapter 5 because I, the, the whole thing is a story that I want you to immerse yourself into so that you can understand. And the name of this message, if you will, can you read the writing on the wall? <laughs> and there's going to be six things that we're going to uh, notice about this story. Let's begin. Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. I think they got everything covered there. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said unto the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. 
Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was, the, then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. That's what the stony means, astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. I wonder why he wasn't called in there with them. Interesting point. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard senses and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, notice she's calling him by his real name, and he will show you the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel which are of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. I love Daniel's response. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another, yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. And then Daniel starts with an excoriation. You know what that is? An excoriation? This is what it is. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like unto the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses, and they fled, or excuse me, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of the house of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, tekel a parson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meany means God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. I can see him just saying meany to meany. This is it. You're done. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. 
And Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night, in that very night, was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. About 62 years old. Now, if you go on in the book of Daniel, you'll read that King Darius and Daniel were pretty close. Uh, king Darius actually loved Daniel. and uh, But still, there's precedents and there's things that people do, uh, especially to try to get somebody in trouble. We still see that in today's times. Uh, think of the, the cake baker that wanted to... Uh, wanted people to know that they do not uh, they don't do homosexual weddings and and so they so they bring it before the whole land and everybody and they try to, to shame them they try to uh, take them to court and everything and I'm thankful that the Supreme Court has up, upheld some of those things but uh, in this day in in the day of this time they would still try to get somebody who was serving the Lord and and try to bring them down mm -hmm. and they did so with Daniel uh, and then the lion's den, and that was dur during King Darius's reign. And uh, we're not going into that one at this time because we're we're sticking with this chapter. But you see, uh, even the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were brought down. And they they served the Lord, but uh, you know people knew that they were not going to bow down to idols. And so there's these ones, these wicked people that will will set up something. They'll set up the whole scenario to try to bring down a, a Christian, a person trying to serve the Lord. Anyway, the first thing we want to notice about this uh, uh, entire chapter is notice the feast. Very glamorous. A thousand of his lords. A thousand. Man, that's a lot of people. How many people can we fit in here? About 200? Maybe about two, two or three hundred people. Be like three times what this, and that's just the lords. That's just the, the the dignitaries in his kingdom. And he brings in these people, and he's throwing them a feast. That must be a pretty pretty big banquet room he had. But notice the feast. It's glamorous. So is sin. Sin is glamorous, and it's enticing. There are multitudes that enjoy sin's feasts. We see it everywhere today. We, we, we have plenty of media outlets and stuff to watch uh, the, the, the sins that, that are enticing constantly. How many ads do you see on... You didn't used to have these, by the way. How many ads do you see for different alcohol, uh, you know, the, even the hard alcohol? They, they didn't used to put that. It didn't used to be in the magazines. It didn't used to be because they knew what happens with those kind of things and so they they did away with them but it's coming back those kind of things and and things that draw your attention to uh, sinful things sin makes a mockery of god verse two belshazzar while he tasted the wine commanded to bring the gold and silver why did he do that why did he bring the vessels that nebuchadnezzar had brought out of the temple in order to make a mockery of God. Yes. I mean, it wasn't just that these were really cool things. I mean, they had things to drink out of. They didn't need this, but they brought them out, I don't know, perhaps parading them through the streets maybe so that the, the ones that were in captivity could see, here goes the vessels of the... Now, notice, notice something here. It never says that, that Nebuchadnezzar did that. I think Nebuchadnezzar had those things locked away put away because Nebuchadnezzar after God was finished with him if you look at that last look at verse 37 from chapter 4 it says now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to abase well he didn't know he was talking about his grandson did he yes I think I think this Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. I don't think it was his son. You know how sometimes in the Bible it talks about his father or something, it actually means his ancestor. 
I think Nebuchadnezzar's, he may not have had a direct descendant as a son to take over the throne, but he had a daughter, and I think that daughter might be this queen that we see that comes in and talks to him. So uh, this is just from doing a little bit of reading. <clears throat> but little does Nebuchadnezzar know that he's about talking about his grandson here. Uh, but this tells you that Nebuchadnezzar recognized God after, after he went through all that he went through. So they used the vessels to mock God. Notice between the difference between uh, the beginning of sin and its completion. Jump down to verse 6. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, and his joints got loose, and his knees knocked together. You know, when they say to you, your knees knocking? There's a lot of stuff that comes out of this chapter right here. It's an old saying that we have, isn't it? Can you read the writing on the wall? <laughs> it's an old saying, and, and even people that don't know anything about the Bible might use that saying because it means, do you understand what's going on? Can you read the writing on the wall? Um, and, and it says right here, you know, your, your knees knocking. I know there's, a, there's an adage that you say about your knees knocking together because you're so afraid. You're so scared. But notice the difference between the beginning of sin. They were having a feast, having him a good old time. And then in verse 6, his knees knocking together for the fear that he had. Secondly, notice the handwriting in verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick. And that tells you that it's at night time, okay? And this would be the time that you'd be having a, a big party over against the candlestick. Now, I don't know. That could be, uh, this is just me surmising, this could be the candlestick from out of the, the temple. What do you think? Maybe. It's possible. There are three times in history that God wrote with his own hand. You know the times? We know one of them, the, the, the Ten Commandments, correct? God wrote with his own finger in the tablets of stone. Exodus chapter 20 is where we find that. Look over in John chapter 8. This is interesting. In verse 5 it says, Now Moses, look back in verse 4. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, uh, in the law, commanded us that, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And they said this, tempting him that he might uh, have to accuse him. But uh, Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. That's in, print, that's in uh, italics, you know. So when they continued to ask him, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And he stooped back down and wrote on the ground. What was he writing? Anybody know? <laughs> we don't know. We can only surmise. But Jesus was writing something on the ground. And he never did anything without a purpose. Amen. But one by one, these men left. And then he asks her, Where are your accusers? I believe, and some people that I have talked to, that Jesus was writing sins on the, on the ground that were very pertinent to each one of these men that were there, each one of these ones that were accusing. Uh, but three times God wrote, this time that, that we have a record of, uh, the Ten Commandments and when Jesus wrote on the ground. Uh, this handwriting of judgment uh, was for Belshazzar. But all three times that we see that God writing with his finger was concerning sin. Right? The law, the breaking of the law, and the uh, judgment for law. For, for judgment for the breaking of the law. Now when God writes anything, man had better take notice. And as Jesse said, God has written something and here it is. We need to take notice. Third thing, <clears throat> notice Belshazzar. He was a rebellious 
sinner. He was making an open mockery of God, using the sacred vessels of the temple to drink from, flying his sin in God's face. Did he not learn anything from his grandfather? Did Nebuchadnezzar not turn anything uh, down to him or give him any kind of inclination that this is God? Don't, uh, don't disrespect God. Don't do things. Uh, humble yourself. And that's what he said in that last verse of chapter 4. God has a way of sobering a person, sometimes immediately. Belshazzar didn't know it, but his judgment was already rendered. Think about this. He's having a big party, right? And he's got a big banquet going on with all his people and everything, and they're just whooping it up and drinking and having a good time. In order for him to be killed that night, as the Scripture tells us, the Medes and the Persians and King Darius, they must have already been upon them. They didn't, they didn't have like the military with uh, planes that could drop bombs and, and things. They must have already been moving and already encompassing the, uh, the city of uh, Babylon. Because that's where this takes place. Now think about this. Uh, Brother Bowen's been teaching about uh, Ezekiel and about how the things that were were uh, uh, prophesied for the children of Israel and, and here comes Nebuchadnezzar and fulfills that prophecy and takes, and takes them captive and takes them back to Babylon. And now here is the fulfilling of a prophecy again. Again with Daniel. Remember the prophecy at the first part of the uh, beginning of this book where the Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it's a big tall statue and it has a head of gold and shoulders of silver and a uh, torso of brass and then the legs of, of brass and clay mixed. And see, then it, it, this was, not only was that a prophecy of the, the fall of the Babylonian Empire, but also on down through. Uh, some things I think maybe not having been fulfilled yet from that prophecy, but that's, that was Daniel giving Nebuchadnezzar the uh, interpretation of that dream. See? And his son, and, and Daniel's around to see it. Isn't that interesting? Daniel gave, makes a prophecy, and he's around to see it happen. Very interesting. <clears throat> but Belshazzar was troubled. His conscience told him that what he was doing was wrong. That his whole life was full of prideful arrogance against God. You know, sin troubles people. They know in their very being that sin is wrong. Things that you do that are wrong. God gives it to us from very young age. We know. Yet they, we, revel in it, enjoy it, and we fly it in God's face. That's a terrible place to be in, in rebellion against God. Notice also that Belshazzar encouraged all of those that are with him to drink from the vessels of the temple. You ever heard the saying, if everybody's doing it, it must be okay? He caused a whole lot of people here to sin. And who knows how many of them lost their lives that night. It doesn't say. It talks about him. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 21. We'll read that. Proverbs Eleven and verse twenty-one. It says, "Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered." Just because there's a whole lot of people doing it, that doesn't mean it's going to be excused. God does not excuse sin, and it doesn't matter how many people are, are joined. And it talks about in the old in, in the uh, in the the times to come that there be the whole world will be gathered against. God and against Israel and he will wipe them out. It doesn't matter how many hand in hand they are. So is there safety in numbers? <laughs> Not when it's against God. There is no safety. Fourth thing we want to look at is notice Daniel. Daniel was a spiritual man. Look at verse 11. The 
queen explaining this says, There's a man in thy kingdom who is, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And if she knew God, she would have said the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding, wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, uh, consulted. <clears throat> Daniel had a reputation of being virtuous. You know, the world will never have respect for God's people until the hour of calamity comes. Where did they, what, did they call for Daniel when they were having their party? No, only after the thing uh, happens that, that this Belshazzar, I think he knew something bad was about to happen. Why else would he be so afraid? He was the king. He was the king of a, a huge empire. But yet this brought him to his knees knocking, right? And so then they call for Daniel, virtuous man. Did anybody... Many of you have lived through uh, September 11th when our nation was attacked. Anybody come to you and ask you to pray? Did, any, did anybody make concerns about how that America needs to return to God in that hour of, of our calamity? That's the only time that you see uh, people seeking out those that are God's people is when there's trouble. When the calamity comes. Daniel walked with God. Look in verse 14. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee and that light and understanding is excellent wisdom is, is found in thee. <clears throat> Daniel walked with God. He, was, he communed with God. We know that from uh, the next few chapters that Daniel prayed in his house with the windows open. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he wanted to be sure that everybody heard that he prayed to the Lord. Uh, and, and that's a kind of a witness. You know, when you pray to God, it's a witness for you. Yes. Do we walk or talk or commune with our Heavenly Father? Or do we fear the very wicked world that mocks our faith and shames us into silence? Think about it. Daniel was not silent. And he did not fear this wicked king. That's why I say I love his answer to the king. Let your gifts be to another. Uh, keep, make the, keep it to yourself. Keep, your, keep the gifts yourself. You're going to need them. I mean, he, he, I don't know Daniel. I didn't know if Daniel knew what, that the king was going to be killed that very night or not. I don't know. But uh, Daniel's, I could just see him saying, it's not going to be worth anything very much in, in pretty soon time here anyways. He did not serve God for personal gain. In verse 17, that's where he says, Thy gifts be to thyself. Uh, the riches of this world may take hold on some. The enchant enchantments of gold and silver steal some away from faithful service to God. In uh, 1 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 3 and 8. Let me read that. First, Tim, First Timothy. I don't know if I can find it here. First, Tim, First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3 says, these are qualifications for a, a, a pastor says, so not given to wine, no striker, nor greedy, a filthy lucre. That's money, filthy money. But patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Look down at verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, nor given to much wine, not greedy, of filthy lucre. There are people that are greedy for, what do they call it, dirty money? Uh, if, if it's tainted, Daniel did not serve God for money. It would, it would be dirty if you did. We don't serve God for money. Uh, notice also that Daniel was not surprised. He was not aghast that this took place. It, you know, Daniel didn't go, wait, what? A, a hand came out and started writing on the wall. Are you kidding me? Really? 
Daniel didn't, it was, this was not a surprise to Daniel. Uh, as children of God, we are aware that there is punishment for sin, and that our God is holy, and He is not mocked. Galatians 6 and verse 7. This is, uh, I can't quote it, but it's, let me, let me just turn there. Galatians 6 and verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. King Belshazzar was about to sow what he had reaped his whole life. Uh, but God is not mocked, and it should not surprise us if we see those that are mocking God come to us. Who am I thinking of? Madeline Murray O'Hare. She mocked God, did she not? Her entire life she mocked God. What happened to her? Anybody know? No, we don't know. She ended up dead somewhere. We have no idea what happened to her. There is, there is serious consequence for mocking the holy God. What is your reason for doing that if you do so? Do you think that a person can mock God and just walk away from that? Uh, it's never happened in the Bible. I don't think it's ever happened in any other time of life, period of time whatsoever. Fifth thing. Notice God's message in verse 25. Meeny, meeny, tekel of harson. Meeny means numbered. That's the days of life. We only have so much time on earth. You know, a lot of us think that we have many days ahead of us. We don't. It's been almost a year. My brother passed away. And I think about him almost every day. Didn't seem like it was time for him to pass away. But then I think about my own self. I don't have any promise of tomorrow. You don't have any promise of tomorrow. So we only have so much time on earth. And how will you spend yours? Tikel means weighed. This is the ways of life. When God puts you in the balances, are you going to be found wanting? This story should touch each one of us because we all know that we fall far short of the glory of God. And with Parson or Perez means broken. This is the thread of life. You know, we will, we will leave all things behind. All the things that we gather up our entire lives, we will leave it all behind. That was very evident here recently as we helped Brother France move his things out of his apartment and ended up with just maybe one or two things at his new place. But those things are not the things that Brother France loves. He could care less. If he has a place to sit, he's fine. He's got a home in glory, and he has many riches there. Many riches there. He is he's set, if you will, in heaven. But these things of this life, we, we you can't take them with us. Amen. And even if we could, I am so taken with that story of the man, and it's not true, of course, but if it was, it's very interesting. A man finally figures out a way. That when he dies, he takes a whole armload of gold to heaven. And they ask him, why are you bringing pavement here? We don't need any more of that. If gold is made for pavement in heaven, then what is the true riches? You need to think about what the true riches are. God tells us what the true riches are in His Word.
loving one another, being kind, being compassionate, taking, doing the things that Christ would do. These are the things that are true riches. <clears throat> Men are tempted to say that they hope that their good outweighs their bad. You know, we've heard that before. Are you going to heaven? Yeah, I, I hope so. I, I think I'm a pretty good person. I think my good will outweigh my bad in, in the balance. Of what, I don't know what balances they're using. But God's scales are perfect. And unless you are perfect, you're not going to balance in those scales. His divine judgment is holy. And no man can come close to God's standards. No man. Sixthly, this lastly, notice God's judgment in verse 30. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. The wages of sin is death. This night was supposed to be a big time party. But God had other plans for Belshazzar. Daniel told him in verses 22 and 23 that though he knew of Nebuchadnezzar's humbling by God, though he knew there was one God in heaven who rules over the kingdom of men, he, Belshazzar, was lifted up with pride. Daniel was not careful to tell him this. And I, I really think that is just, that's a very bold thing for a man to do. And I think there's not enough bold men telling people in positions of power like it is, like it should be. Belshazzar did not glorify God. And he met the same demise as Herod in Acts chapter 12. Do you remember that? Herod was speaking to these people and they said, oh no, this is the voice of a God, not a man. And he did not give God the glory of what happened. The angel smote him and he was, oh, he was eating of worms and he died. He gave up the ghost right then. Look, God does not share his glory with another. He tells us so in his word. He's a jealous God. Yes, amen. Kings, presidents, all those in positions of authority and power, you need to listen up. God deserves and demands the glory due His name, and He will not share it with another. And God is not mocked. You need to understand that. To do otherwise, you do at your own peril. You did not get where you are by your own accomplishments. God puts you there, just as we read here in this scripture. God puts one up, sets one up, takes down another. And he can take you down just as easily as he puts you in the position that you are. You need to do what you're supposed to do in a position of authority. And that is serve the Lord. Have respect to him. Belshazzar found out that the judgment of God is swift and sudden. We find that in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Pride cometh before a fall, and a haughty spirit before destruction. Pride and arrogance. God not only hates these, but He puts them down. And quickly. Have we not seen? There's been many rulers, even in our own day and time, we've seen that they have... They've gone by the wayside because God's taken them out quickly. Death is swift and sudden, and, and Belshazzar found that to be so. As I said before, we have no promise of tomorrow. Don't rely on your righteousness to save you. It won't. If you go out into eternity without Christ, you will be found wanting in the balances. The only way that that balance, God's balance, the scales can be tipped in the favor is if, is, because, is if a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and has Him as His Savior. You need His righteousness, not your own. We see here the foolish pride that Belshazzar walked in and had no regard for the God of heaven. Don't be like this king. See the handwriting on the wall. It says, repent and believe the gospel of Christ. 
God will save you. And because of Him, the balances can be in your favor. Let's all stand. We'll be dismissed.